So it's one of our sister churches. Jazz Place is a Southern Baptist Church or Canadian National Baptist Church, if you like. Um, we had that team at the executive today, but um, but uh, him, I've known Jonathan since he was in college and uh, at the U of A, and he's he's a graduate from U of A, that elitist school on the south side of the city of Edmonton, where Ardell graduated from too. And uh, it's uh, he was a, in the faculty of education, and then he went on to our seminary where I went to school. He came after I did. But uh, Jonathan's a double major. He has a master's in divinity and master of religious ed. And uh, anyways, I think you'll enjoy hearing him. He, has, he usually has a good word from God. And uh, he's sort of gave me a little hint as to what he's, where direction we're going to go. Uh, thank you for inviting me to come on out and be a part of your retreat this weekend. I uh, look forward to getting to know you more. Some of you already know. Uh, Maddie I know and Chester I know and Angelina and Ryan and Carla I know a little bit. Uh, hopefully I'll get to know uh, some of the rest of you more. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. So I hope we'll have a chance to kind of get to know each other and uh, build some relationships. And that's what retreats are about, right? Just to have fun and enjoy and have fellowship and uh, build relationships. And one of the relationships we want to make sure that is a part of everything that we do is our relationship with God. And so I'm praying that God is going to impact our lives this weekend. Uh, I don't know what it is that He's going to do, but I expect Him to... Uh, uh, move in our hearts. I expect Him to be here. I expect Him to touch our hearts, draw us closer to Him, grow in our relationship with Him. Uh, I think it's important in our relationship with God uh, to understand that we need to expect that He's here. Uh, you know, sometimes I hear people praying and saying, Lord, we invite you to come. We need to invite God to come. God is here. God was here before we got here today. God was ready and waiting for us to arrive here because he has a plan uh, for what he wants to do this weekend. Each and every single one of you, uh, and I just want to let you know this off the start so that we can kind of get on the same footing and on the same ground, but I've, I strongly and firmly believe that God has a plan for each and every one of you that is here today uh, and for this weekend. He's brought you here because he has a reason and a purpose. He wants to teach you something. He wants to show you something more about who he is. He wants to reveal himself to you in a new and an exciting way. He wants to develop the relationship between you and Him. In fact, He wants that more than you do. He loves you desperately. He loves you with a love that the Bible says is deeper than anything we can comprehend. It's wider than we can see. It's, it's higher than we can understand. God's love for us is incredible. And so He has gone to a lot of work to make sure that you're here this weekend. God loves you enough, I believe, that he would move mountains to make sure that you are here because he wants to say something to you. Uh, and so I hope that you're praying and asking God and saying, what do I expect? God, what do you want from me this weekend? What do you want me to learn about you? And I hope that you don't hear Jonathan Chisholm this weekend. I hope that you're, you hear God. I hope that you're hearing God speak his truth to you and gets to know you more that uh, sort of opens up that relationship more to a, the next level that he wants uh, to take you to. So I hope that you're praying with me on that. Uh, pray that we'll be listening, all of us, including myself, to hear what it is that God wants to, wants to say to us this weekend. Uh, your theme this weekend is what? Fearless. Fearless, yeah. Uh, Dennis told me, uh, when he asked me if I would, if I would come, and uh, I asked him, well, what, what's the theme? And he said, well, I'll let you know as soon as our group is... And so I know that you guys have prayed over that, your leadership team, and, and you came to the decision that, uh, that fearless was the theme that you want for this, uh, for this weekend. Now there's, there's a reason for that. God is, has, wants to teach us something about being fearless. I mean, otherwise, you wouldn't have put that on your hearts. Uh, and when, when we talk about fearless, we need to talk about fear. Because if you're going to be less of fear, or not to have that fear, you've got to, talk, you've got to face fear. And so, uh, what are some of your fears? What are some of the things that you're afraid of? When we came in here, Carla said, I looked at these, I'm like, what is all that? Ast astrophysics and biology and <laughs> physics. And she goes, those are my fears right there. <laughs> <laughs> what are you afraid of? What are, uh, you know, what, what are some things that people are afraid of? Maybe you don't want me, maybe, maybe it's too personal, you just don't, you're not ready to tell me your deepest, darkest fear yet. Uh, but what are some things that people are afraid of? 
Heights, yeah, that's a big one. Lots of people are afraid of heights. Lots of people would, you know, anything above, you know, you know, even standing on a chair. Some people don't want to go anywhere near that. You know, I don't want to stand on a chair. Uh, for me, it was my dad was always telling me to get down out of the tree or get off the roof or something like that. Fear was not, that was not a, something I was afraid of. But what about something else? Anything else? The garage door falling on me. The garage door falling on you. Wow, okay, that's a very specific fear, but okay, I can see that. You're thinking, is it going to hold? Is it going to hold? Come on in, join us. Don't be afraid. We're just talking about fear. Come on in. Come forth. What are some things you guys are afraid of? Coming in. Oh, your mom. Okay. Okay. There's some honesty right there. Good, good. Not a, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Probably a lot of parents wish that you had a good healthy fear. I wasn't healthy. <laughs> I, was, I was a little afraid of my dad when I was a young man. It, was, it kept me from doing a few things that I shouldn't have done. It was a good thing. What are some other things that you're afraid of, that people are afraid of? Dogs. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Dogs. You know, there was a guy I knew down in Calgary. He was afraid of cats. You know, you hear about people being afraid of dogs all the time, but very rarely do you hear someone being... We had to put our cat in the room when he came to our house because he was so afraid of the, the cat was going to... Yeah, like a, like a real fear. Other things. What are the things that we're afraid of? Spiders. Spiders, snakes. Yeah. Yeah? Flowers? Baldness. Baldness. <laughs> yeah. Some of us had to get over that fear. It's... it's, it's it's either on its way or it's inevitable. Yeah. Okay. What about as Christians? What are some things that we're afraid of when it comes to our faith uh, uh, walk, our relationship with God, or, or just living out the life of being a Christian? What are some things that we're afraid of? Not having salvation. Not having salvation. Yeah. Yeah, good. Anyone else? Fear of disappointing God. Fear of disappointing God. Yeah. Yeah? I think a fear of not living a meaningful life. Fear of not living a meaningful life. Yeah. Sometimes that fear uh, 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 drives people to God, doesn't it? Because they're, they're afraid that life is, is, you know, what's the worth? What's the value? Where is this? You know, is there a point to life? And that fear causes them to search and find out God. Oh, right. Yeah, good point. Yeah, not living up to expectations. Yeah, that either God has of us or other people around us have of us. Yeah, good. Well, your theme verse uh, for this weekend is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6. And uh, it says, so that we confidently say... The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? What a great verse. We're going mean, to learn that. Every time we get together to speak, we're going to go over that verse. That's going to be our, our sort of our jumping off point. Every single time, the next four times, or ne this time and the next three times, we, we get together to, to spend time in music and worship and, and, and seeking and, and diving into God's word. We're going to look at this. This is, this is a, uh, an important promise that we're given to us by God. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? I think it's in, 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 in extremely important for us as Christians to understand who is our God and our relationship with Him. That He loves us, that He wants to be our helper, as this verse says, and we have nothing to be afraid of. See, there's another person out there, another one out there, Satan, who wants us to believe the exact opposite. In fact, he's the one who's churning and fueling the fires of fear. Fear is one of his tools, okay? Scripture says in, in 2 Timothy uh, 1.7 that uh, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Did you hear that? God did not give us a spirit of fear. Now, Scripture is very clear that we need to fear God. Fear who He is as Almighty God. 
Fear disobeying him. Fear uh, his his power as, as a king of kings and lord of lords, that he is judge, that we need to fear him. But anything else besides that, fear of anything else, is not from him. Satan is doing his work on our hearts and in our minds, playing with our minds. Scripture in a number of different places, in Ephesians and other places, talks about the schemes of the evil one. And he likes to play on our minds. And he likes to get at us, and he likes to, to try to find places for us to, uh, to kind of grab a hold of, because fear controls. Do you know that? Kings, rulers, uh, uh, countries in, 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 our, in our history of, our, of the globe have used fear to control people. Right? I mean, even think if you, if, if you have a fear of... Uh, of um, What's it called when you have a claustrophobia? When you a fear of small places, right? Okay, for some people who have claustrophobia, an elevator is a horrible place to be. And that fear controls that person so that they can't go into an elevator. Like, what if they have a friend that lives on the 13th floor? <laughs> right? Well, I want to go visit my friend. He's, they're my friend and I need to go and I'm supposed to go up and have lunch, supper with them or whatever. I gotta take the stairs, and you gotta walk up 13 flights of stairs. Ooh. Can you imagine 13 flights of stairs to go visit your friend on the 13th floor? Why? Because your fear controls you that you can't go into the elevator and just push a button and whoop up and step back out, right? Those of you who are claustrophobic, you go up the stairs, I walk into the elevator, push a button, get out at the top 13th floor, and sit down. Now, you worked off your meal before you got there, right? Fear controls. And Satan uses fear to control us. And so God is saying to us, and I think he wants to say to those of us who are here this weekend, we do not need to be afraid. We do not need to let fear control us. In fact, we shouldn't let fear control us. What will man do to me? He says, I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I am the creator of all that exists. And I am your helper. Do you under, does, does that click? Does that kind of... Let that settle into your mind for just a minute. God, creator of all things, is your helper. <coughs> Those... The people at Jasper Place are probably are tired of me saying this phrase. Most of you won't have heard me say it, so I get to use it again. One of my favorite sayings, uh, it's not mine, I didn't make it up, but it's about God. It says, the, the amazing thing about God is he um, took nothing, made it into something, stuck it in the middle of nowhere, told it to stay there, and it did. Do you get that? God took nothing made it into something, hung it in the middle of nowhere, told it to stay there, and it did. That's the power of Almighty God. The God that desires to have a relationship with each and every one of you. The God that in this verse says He is our helper. What, what, did, what can man do if I'm your helper? If I put every molecule in place that is in place in this universe, if I put every planet where it was supposed to be, every star, I told it to go there and it stayed there, if I put everything together, I've, I've fashioned and formed you as a human being, I put everything on this earth that there is, if that is the kind of power that our God has, if He is our helper, why do we need to be afraid of what man can do? We don't. We have no reason to fear. But Satan likes to, he likes to manipulate us. He likes to control us. You know, it's interesting that if, if we're going to look at verse 6, we really need to back up and look at verse 5. And verse 5 says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. That's a promise from God to each and every one of you and I. I will never leave you or forsake you. But as oftentimes God gives us a truth before the promise. 
If you do this, I promise this. And he is saying here, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Make sure your heart is not on the things of the world. Make sure your heart is focused on me. If your character is such that your heart is focused on me and you are content with what you have, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. There is nowhere you can go that I will not be there right beside you. Some people are afraid of the dark. Some people wouldn't come to a retreat or a camp like this because of their fear of the dark. Some of you might be afraid of the dark and you've overcome that because we have these neat little things called flashlights and you've brought one with you, right? Well, you can go into the darkest, dark place and have no flashlight and God will be there with you. You have nothing to be afraid of. I think it's also interesting that Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 31. These two ver this verse is quoted, verse, chapter 6 is, is quoted from verse 6 of 31 in Deuteronomy. It says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. The Lord, in verse 8, it says, The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. God is giving us a promise. He's saying that there is nothing that comes across in your path of your life that you need to face alone. See, a lot of times we're afraid because we have to do something on our own. I'm not sure if that's why ladies go to the bathroom together. I don't know what it's in them that they're so afraid of. But they go together. I'm going to the washroom. Okay, come with me then. Well, I'll go together. Right? There are things like that that guys do. You know? Guys go hunting. They got to go together. I don't know why. So there's more opportunities to shoot one another. I don't know. But they got to go together. Right? Because venturing off into the unknown, if you do it by yourself, that's scary. Right? But if you have someone with you, you sort of have that support. You have that that extra courage because you're there together. Well, God is saying you have no reason to fear anything that comes and faces in your life. I am your helper. I will be there with you. That's a promise from your creator. Probably the only one who has all the resources, all the power, all the might to fulfill every single part of any promise he gives. He never gives a half-hearted promise. He never gives a half-carried-through promise. He only gives promises that he carries out completely. And in these passages, he says to us, You have no reason to fear. The Lord is your helper. Be confident. Be confident in whatever you do. And that means whenever he asks us to do something, whenever he commands us to do something, He's there to help us. He never asks us to do something he's not able to come alongside and help us to do. Sometimes, you know, maybe Pastor Dennis comes to you and says, I'd like you to, you know, maybe try taking you. Oh, no, I would never do that. No, I, no, you got, you got the wrong person. Go ask somebody else. That scares me to death. You know, I don't want to do that. Moses said that and got him himself into a lot of trouble. God never asks us to do something he's not willing to come alongside of us and help us to do what he's commanded us to do. Satan, on the other hand, wants to drive us away through fear. I want to talk, I want to, I want to tell you a story. I like to tell stories. If you don't know me, you'll, you'll find that out. I like to tell stories. Um, I want you to realize that as we go through this weekend... As we talk about being fearless, I want you to take away tonight that you need to be fearless to obey. Fearless to obey God. <laughs> Whatever it is that God commands us to do, we need to be fearless in our obedience. Fear often gets in our way and stops us from doing something. And God had many joys and, and treasures and 
blessings on the other side of that thing if we'd have just gone ahead and done what he told us to do. Taken his help and said, all right, Lord, with your strength and your power, we're going to try and do it. But because of fear, we stopped. This story is a story that probably most of you are going to remember, are going to know. It's from the Old Testament. Moses has, has led the Israelites out of Egypt. They, uh, they know that God has promised them the promised land. Canaan is the promised land. And they know that that's what God has brought them out of Egypt to give them back this piece of land that would be theirs. That it would flow with milk and honey. All the promises and all the blessings that they could think of. God has said, I'm going to give you this land. And so, the, Moses has led them out, gone through a bunch of different steps, but they get they get to the edge of the promised land. I mean, it's, it's just right there. It's just over those hills. We can't quite see it, but I mean, we can almost taste it. We're so close. And Moses does something that probably most sort of leaders, strategic, logical thinking individuals would do. We don't know what's on the other side of those hills. We have no idea. So we're afraid of the unknown, right? That, the, that's one of the greatest things we have a fear of is the unknown. So what does he do? He, send, he picks out 12 people, one person from every tribe, 12 guys to send into the land as spies. Because the land is not just sitting there, it's inhabited. There are people living there. There are people who have cities and they've lived there for 400 years. These are people that Abraham walked through among them 400 years earlier, testifying to who God was. And after 400 years, these people had chosen to still turn their backs on God and not, and not believe. And so part of what's about to happen to them is their judgment as well as a promise God's given his people to have this land. And so these 12 men go in and they, the rest of the group stays behind. They all, they're going to hang tight and wait till these 12 guys scout it out, recon, right? Go in there and do some reconnaissance, check it all out, and then come back and let everybody know what the land is like. So these 12 guys take off and they go in and sure enough, they get there and the land is phenomenal. I mean, they, it's got, it says that they, the, the vines grow grapes that are huge. I mean, they, anything that you want to grow, I mean, the land was just filled with that idea of milk and honey. I mean, it just was the land, anything you wanted to grow, it grew and there were big juicy fruit all over the place. I mean, it was just wonderful. But they also discovered that there was a lot of people living there. And they had big, strong, fortified cities. And some of the people that lived in the land were great, big, huge giants. I mean, massive, tall people. Big, big people. And so these 12 guys check it all out and they come back. And they have a meeting with Moses. So Moses goes, so how's it going? What, like, how, what was it? Tell me. Share with me the information. What did you find? And they said, well, you know what? It's just as you know, God told us. It's, you know, it's all this beautiful. It's got all the fruit. It's got all the this. It's got all the blah, 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 blah. And it's great. It's wonderful. So Moses is like, yeah, I knew it. I knew this. Would, this is great. It's gathering the people. Let's tell them. And so the, ten or, the 12 are telling them all the good stuff. But the 10 then stop and say, but you know what? There's these people that live there. And they've got strong, fortified cities. I mean, they're, they're, they're ready. I mean, they're, it's not just like, you know, going to be a walk in the park, just walk in there and over top of them. I mean, they, they've, they've got walls around their cities. They're ready for defense. And then, not only that, but they've got these people that, that are huge. They make us look like insects. They're so big. There's no way we can take this land. Ten of those twelve spies says, no, we're afraid of these guys. We're afraid of the people that live there. There's no way that we can take this land. Two of those spies, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb say to the people, what these guys are saying is true. There are fortified cities. There are really giant, tall, big, huge guys that live there. But you know what? It doesn't matter. God told us that this is our land. He's told us that he's given these people into our hand. And all we need to do is obey him and go into this land and take it over. And he will, he will wash them away in front of us. So Moses makes a fatal flaw as a leader. And I think sometimes we do this as churches. 
Moses decides instead of using his spiritual education, his spiritual leadership training to apply to what they should do in this situation, he defaults to man's logic and says, you know what? Here's the democratic thing. I'm going to put it to a vote. I'm going to let the people vote whether we should go in and take the land or not. Well, as many of you know the story, the people caught the fear of the ten. And the fear struck them. And even though they knew that God had brought them out of Egypt to give them this land, that He had promised that He would take away, uh, to, to demolish the people in front of them, and that they would give this land to them as theirs, they said, we're afraid. And so they said, we will not go in. Joshua and Caleb were the only two. You know what happened to Israel? Israel suffered the consequences of their disobedience. <coughs> if you know the story, Israel wandered around in the desert for 40 years. Now sometimes people have said, well, because they couldn't, they got lost. A man must have been leading them. They got lost. They didn't have a GPS. They got lost. The Israelites did not get lost for 40 years. Do you know that the, the, the uh, promised land was only a three or four day hike from the Red Sea? From the edge of Egypt, it was only three or four days. So you'd have to be pretty lost to wander around for 40 years. <laughs> Right? And not find the place you're supposed to get to. Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years because God punished them. Because of their disobedience. Because they were afraid. And would not go into the land He promised them. Do you know that the 40 years represents all the adults that were old enough to vote, those people died as they wandered for 40 years in the desert. Because God's consequences for them was, because of your disobedience, you will not set one foot into the promised land I have promised you. Into the blessing, into the place of milk and honey, into the place where I'm going to give to you, you will not set one foot in there. Do you know, of those adults that voted, the only two men that walked into the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. Because they were obedient. Even though they didn't go in, they tried to convince the people with all of their hearts in passion to please. If you read in Numbers 13, they give impassioned pleas to the people. Don't listen. God is bigger than our enemies. God is almighty and He has promised us Let's go fearlessly into this land and He will give it to us. Well, what happened 40 years later? All those people had died. A new generation had risen up. Joshua and Caleb are left. Even Moses, because of his mistake, isn't allowed to go into the promised land. And Joshua leads them in. Now, what's different? 40 years ago, did they have less people? Some people say that they, that they wandered around 40 years so that they could grow enough military so that they could go in and make an attack. And that's Satan trying to use logical tactics to come up with a, an explanation for a God thing. Nothing changed in their resources. Do you know what changed? Their hearts. Joshua, as their leader, said, God is Almighty God. He keeps His promises. He's commanded us to go in and take it. He's promised that up to us. He is our helper. All we need to do is obey. And Joshua led them into the land, and they took it over. God fulfilled every promise that they had. Were there fortified cities? Yes. But God caused them to crumble. Jericho. They didn't even lay a hand on Jericho, and the walls fell down. Now that, I don't know, I don't care what kind of science, chemistry, biology, physics you put to that, that makes no sense. Except that Almighty God reached out His hand from heaven and caused the walls to fall down. Yes, there were giants, but God caused their armies to fall under the foot of His servants. That's what we need to ask ourselves. This weekend...
Why has God brought me here this weekend? He's brought me here to develop my relationship with Him and He wants me to learn more about the fact that I need to be fearless. Fearless to obey Him. No matter what it is that God commands us to do, if He's told us to do it, listen, He's told us to go out and to make disciples. He's told, He's commanded us to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. That's a command. God has said, I will be your helper. Do not be afraid. God wants you to know this weekend that you do not need to fear sharing your faith with someone else. Now, Satan is trying to tell you the opposite end. And he's going to use every trick in his book to try to get your attention to make you think they're going to make fun of me. They're going to something else. They're going to do this. I'm going to be left out. I'm going to be isolated. I'm going to be made fun of. I'm going to be a laughing stock. I'm going to be all these kinds of things. He's going to play on every fear that you have. But what you need to understand is God has said, be confident. You can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Don't trust in your own strength. The Israelites looked at the resources and went, we can't do this. And God was trying to tell them, you're right. You can't do this. I'm going to do it. You just need to obey me. Obey me and watch what I'll do. Obey me and see what I will do. See my strength made perfect in your weakness. Then the people will see my power and not yours. And you will learn and have a relationship with me as the all-powerful, almighty God. And you will know that you have no need, no reason to fear. You say, well, that's a story from the, from the Old Testament. What about today? Well, I'll just tell you quickly a little story of my own. Two and a half years ago, uh, my wife Kathy and I were living down in Cochrane, and we were the student pastors at Bow Valley Baptist Church. I was a full-time pastor, associate pastor. I was making a full-time, a good, a good salary. Kathy was working at a, as a teacher, making a good salary. We thought we had lots of things going on. God was blessing our ministry. We were enjoying it. We were enjoying the people. And in the midst of that, all of a sudden, God said, I want you to consider, I want you to do something. I want, there's this little church in Edmonton. It's actually the church that my wife Kathy grew up going to. They don't have a pastor and they're looking for a pastor. And I, I honestly, to be honest with you, I thought God was just telling us, this was just testing us. And he said, I want you to just put in your resume. And I thought, I just put in my resume and then... You know, they'd turn it down and I'd be, all right, God, I did what you told me to do. Whew. Good deal. Because you know what? This little church in Edmonton had about 18 people going to it. They couldn't offer a full-time salary. They, could, they couldn't even offer half, 20 hours a week. They could offer 16 hours a week. I won't go through all the details, but... God led us through a path that he said, I want, this is what I'm asking you to do. This is what I'm commanding you to do. I'm commanding you to leave where you are, your place of comfort, your security, a place where you have family and friends, you have security in job, you have security in relationships, you have security in future, and I want you to step out, and I want you to go to this little tiny church, they can't even pay you full time. And I want you to trust me. I want you to obey me. Do you know that from the very day that I, the first day that we started, the first paycheck that I got was more than what the church said they could afford to pay. Right from the very first month, God provided some extra funds that came in from, from people. I not, I, to this day, I don't know who they are. Two different people gave, not from the church, Gave money to the church to help to go towards our salary. This is, it's two years 
in June that, that Kathy and I have been there, the church has gotten to a place where they're able to support 85% of a full-time salary. God has taken care of our expenses. He's, he's found ways to make things less expensive. He's provided through other people, through people who've been generous and listened to him prompting them to do things and help things out. God has provided. God is faithful. The only reason I tell you that story is, I, I'm not bragging on me, I'm telling you that the God who promised these things in his word, the God that worked in the lives of Joshua and Caleb, by the way, Joshua and Caleb are the names of my two sons, and for a reason, because I wanted to name my boys after two men who were not concerned about the circumstances of the world around them, but they knew that God had commanded and that they would be men of obedience. I want my two boys to grow up to have the character of Joshua and Caleb. That they don't look at the circumstances around them and let that determine what they do. They know what God tells them to do and they will do it. That's my desire for my two boys. That's my desire for my life. And that would be my desire. I believe God's desire for each and every one of us. To understand that when God obey, commands us to do something, we need to obey. Don't be afraid of the circumstances. Don't be afraid of all these things, your insecurities, your reasons that you don't want to do something or don't like to do something or you're scared. God is saying, I am Almighty God. I love you. I'm commanding you to do it. I'm your helper. I'm going to go with you. Just obey me.